I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little bit, Tony, how are you today? Oh, I'm just wonderful and just as happy as can be. You know why? No, why? Because the stork brought a new little baby to the people next door. Oh, really? Yes, the cutest little baby girl. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yes, I just love storks. They do the nicest things. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I know a good riddle about a stork. Oh, goody, what is it? Why does a stork stand on one leg? Oh, that. If he picked up the other leg, he'd fall down. Uh... I guess I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Oh, you're very smart, but they've been telling that riddle around the house ever since the baby was born. Oh. Well, I guess I better... Yes, uh, please read the funnies. Uh, Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Yeah. All right, very well, I will in just a moment, but before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Sticks guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for a hop along. (laughs) Hoppy and his pals have finally discovered that Wiley, the fake doctor in the town of Buckskin, is the leader of the Ghost Raiders. They've trailed Wiley to the entrance of the Rock Maze Cave. Today, as they surround him, Wiley says... How did you manage to locate this rock maze cave? Hoppy replies, That's your own doings, Wiley. You made the mistake of starting that brawl with me in your office. You realized you were cornered and had to escape. The last thing I remember was you slugging me with that stove poker. I must have toppled against you, ripping off your side coat pocket as I fell. In it was this diagram, which seemed to describe this maze of passages. That's what led us here. California exclaims, big picture, third row. Yeah, straight to the hiding place of all the loot you and your ghost raider stole. Sheriff says, first picture, next row. Looks like the game is over, Wiley. Wiley snarls. Yes, it will be for the first man who comes near me. The last picture, fourth row, he pulls a little bottle out of his pocket, saying, this bottle contains enough nitroglycerin to blow us all to blazes. I'm leaving by the rear exit from this cave, and I'd advise you to keep your distance till I'm out of here. Hoppy says, first picture, next row. Don't be a fool, Wiley. Hand over that bottle. And he begins to walk toward Wiley, who starts to back away from Hoppy. California calls. Hey, come back, Hoppy. You can't reason with him. The fool's gone start loco. Slowly, Hoppy moves toward Wiley, who continues to walk backward, holding the bottle in his trembling hands. Suddenly, Wiley stumbles. California yells, Look out! Wiley falls to the ground, and... Last of the explosion knocks Hoppy and his pals out into the open air. The cave crashes down on Wiley. Last picture... They look at the sealed-up entrance of the cave, which is now Wiley's tomb. Hoppy says, well, I guess that closes the case on Wiley. Too bad. California exclaims, Yeah, I'll say it is. We could have used an extra hand to help get that stolen loot back to its rightful owners. Because after all, he was going to kill Hoppy and California and Lucky and everybody. Yeah, it's a lucky thing for Hoppy that he was near the entrance to the cave when Wiley stumbled. Oh, it certainly was. Well, now Hoppy has ended this adventure, and it certainly was exciting. Yes, indeed. I hope next week we'll have another exciting adventure. Oh, I'm sure we will. Now, I'll bet you it's time for Prince Val. He's always on page three. Well, let's look and see if he's there. All right. See, there he is. Yes, see, there he is. Last week was exciting because the captain of the ship that Val was sailing on defeated the pirates. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're continuing on their way home, Val and Arf and the pretty young girl Adele, whom Arf has fallen in love with. Let's read more about them today and see what happens next. All right, here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. (laughs) 
Val looks at the smoke pouring up from the pirate ship, which is disappearing in the distance, and sheathes the singing sword. Never before has he seen a pirate ship so easily discouraged. A brazier of burning coals and a skin of naphtha has left the Corsair ablaze. The ship continues on its way. Cape Finisterre is passed, and the ship sails out upon the wild bay of Biscay, where winter storms are their only peril. For the Viking pirate ships are rowed by hardy fighting men, and the sail is used only when winds are favorable. When the storms are raging and they must move forward only by rowing, they beach their ship in some sheltered cove, as we see them doing last picture top row. But the Mediterranean mariners put far out to sea at day's end, and with shortened sail glide forward through the next night, and then each sailor faces toward his homeland and prays to his God. And each one says a prayer for the helmsman, as we see big picture in the middle of the page. For it is in the helmsman's strong hands that their lives are trusted through the dark hours. And often Arf will take his lute and help speed the lonely hours, singing songs of sheltered homes amid fruit trees and sunny meadows far from the troubled sea. At last, first picture bottom row, the misty shores of Britain appear, and they search for some landmark, for they have no instruments of navigation to tell them where they are. One hole! And in a short time, they are putting into harbor. Arf and Adele stand side by side as the vessel docks at Executor. Their two young hearts are troubled. For this is the hour of parting. And then, last picture, the sailors gather in front of Arf, and the helmsman says, We, uh, we have a gift to give the sweet singer whose songs have eased the hardships of the boys. Oh, isn't that sad that Arf and that girl have to part? Yes, it certainly is. Do you think they'll ever see each other again? Well, let's hope so. If they love each other, we certainly hope so. I wonder what surprise the sailors have for young Arf. Well, that's something we'll find out about next week. Now? Well, I can't quite make up my mind, so let's turn over the page and see. Oh, look. There in the middle of the page is Donald Duck. Well, <laughs> let's read that right now. Right. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, jump squee, jump, squee, jump, squee, 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 Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald's attention is aroused by Dewey yelling excitedly. Hey, come quick, Uncle Donald! Come quick, Uncle Donald! Quick news! Out of the house dashes Donald, Huey, and Louie. And Dewey points to a box and says proudly, Look, I catch a kitten. Nine of them. A few weeks later, Donald looks at the kittens who are growing fast, and he says, Go get a basket, a big one. And Dewey replies, Good idea, Uncle Donald. Last picture, top row, Huey and Louie come out of the house carrying a basket. And first picture, bottom row, they put the kittens in the basket and cover them with a nice warm blanket. And then Donald says, Now, take them around and give them every one to every neighbor who's dopey enough to take one. <coughs> Huey exclaims, Oh, gee. They go down the street carrying the basket. And Dewey complains, He sure is dumb sometimes. And Huey says, Yeah, giving away perfectly good kittens. Down the street they go to give away their perfectly good kittens, their faces looking like a thundercloud. <laughs> A little later, third picture, bottom row, they come back in the house carrying the basket. Donald says, Ah, back at last, huh? Managed to give them all away? Huey replies cheerfully, Better than that. He sets the basket down in front of Donald and says, We traded. And he lifts off the blanket. And out of the basket jump a monkey, rabbit, frog, tame rat, chipmunk, turtle, and a parrot. And last picture, Donald tries to read his paper as the parrot, or as the monkey, pulls his hair. And the parrot says, Pretty paw, pretty paw. Hi, sport. Want to buy a duck? And Donald snarls, I'll go fly up there. 
Donald. Yes, I should say so. The kids fooled him that time, didn't they? Trading those kittens for all those other pets. <laughs> and look at Donald. Isn't he mad? I don't know why, though, because I'd love to have a monkey pull my hair and a parrot talk to me. I imagine you would. Yes, I would. But you're not Donald. Well, I wish I were today. I'll bet you do. Well, now what? <laughs> well, this was so funny. I just wonder what funny thing Dagwood and Blondie do today. Well, let's find out. Here they are on the first page of the second section, and here we go. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure my music for Dagwood and Blondie. Herb Woodley, Dagwood's neighbor, is away on a business trip. Tootsie Woodley, his wife, is afraid to sleep at home alone. So Blondie tells Dagwood, second picture... Dagwood, Mrs. Woodley's going to sleep here with me tonight. You go over and sleep in their house. Dagwood answers cheerfully, Okay, I'll get my pajamas. <laughs> By the time you get to the last picture, top row, Dagwood is at the Woodley house settling down for the night. And he says, Gee, Herb's bed's soft and comfortable. It's so quiet here, too. Uh, I'll get a fine night's sleep. First picture, next row, who should be coming up the walk but Herb Woodley returning from his business trip? He exclaims, Oh, gosh, I have no key. And Tootsie's probably sound asleep. Oh, well, I'll go in through a window. So he goes around the house, and he opens the window. He sticks his head in, and... <laughs> he's socked in the head with a baseball bat. And last picture, second row, he lies on the ground with an aching head, and he moans, Oh, that wasn't Tootsie. She can't hit that hard. Oh, I'll go next door and inquire at the bumsteads. <laughs> First picture, third row. Herb has told Tootsie and Blondie what happened. And Blondie tells him... Dagwood is sleeping in your house tonight. Tootsie is sleeping here with me. Herb grits his teeth and exclaims, Give me our key, Tootsie. He dashes out of the house, picks up a club, lets himself in his house quietly, and then tiptoes upstairs. Finds Dagwood in the bedroom sound asleep. And Dagwood is awakened by a sock on the head. He leaps out of bed, thinking Herb is a burglar. And he fights back, saying, And I was having the nicest dream. Out into the hallway they struggle. Down the stairs they roll. Tootsie and Blondie dash in and turn on the lights. And Tootsie exclaims, Boys, boys, stop playing. It's after midnight. Blondie takes Dagwood by the hand and leads him out of the house. He's so beat up he hears birds chattering. As she leads him home, she says... Beautiful night, isn't it? The moon and all the stars are out. Dagwood exclaims, So many stars. Last picture, as he climbs into bed and lays his aching head on the pillow, he says, Be it ever so humble, there's no bed like your own. <laughs> oh, that Dagwood and that Herb. <laughs> they do the silliest thing. Don't they? Uh, they're just like two boys and everything. <laughs> yes. But they certainly are funny, though. I love them. So do I. <laughs> oh, look. Underneath Dagwood and Blondie, there's Roy Rogers. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of page one of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hi yip hi -oh. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi -oh. The outlaws have outsmarted Roy's friend, Cube Root. They've stolen the box of gold and have galloped away with it in the stagecoach. Cube has discovered that the box that he let them take was the real gold and not the box of sand he had meant to go on the coach as a decoy. Today, Roy and Cube are on the trail of the bandits. As they top a rise on the hill, Roy says, second picture. I see dust down the honor in Teton Valley. <laughs> Meanwhile, one of the outlaws looking back sees Roy heading toward him. He hollers. Hey, two hombres entering the valley, Jot. Looks like Rogers and that local transportation expert. Jot, the other, other outlaw, shouts back. Okay, Beetle. We'll outfox him at the next bend. They go around the next bend, and there they rein up. Quickly, they jump out and unload the box of gold dust. Beetle says, Is this the spot where we meet ballast baits? Jut replies, Yeah, he'll handle things from here. I'll drive the stage on to decoy Rogers and Root. Quickly, the box is put behind a bush. 
Beetle hides behind, beside it, gun in hand. Judd climbs on the stagecoach again and gallops away. From around the bend a moment later, last picture top row, Roy and Cube gallop up. Roy yells, There's the stage! I'm riding ahead, Cube! You're holding me up! Cube replies, Yes, but you'll need help handling these outlaws, Roy. Giddy up, Genevieve. And they gallop on after the stagecoach. As they disappear around the bend, Beetle jumps out from his hiding place. Begins to pull the box of gold dust from behind the rocks. First picture, bottom row, a huge man with long hair appears and greets him. Ahoy, Beetle! You're ahead of time! Well, 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 where's Jack? Beetle replies. Oh, he's decoying a couple of meddlers away from the buttes while we hide the gold ballast. You give me a hand here, quick. The huge man picks up the box of gold dust and walks toward a tall rock a hundred feet high with sides that go almost straight up. Ballast says cheerfully, That's Flat Top Butte, Beetle. There's no way up there. So that's where we're catching this gold till things cool off. Beetle exclaims, Hey, quit talking riddles. Hey, wow, this is some wind. As they get to the foot of the rock, Beetle exclaims, Hey, but how in thunder are you going to get the gold up on Flat Top Butte, huh? Ballast grins, opens up the back of the covered wagon standing there, and takes out a huge kite, saying, You're going to find out right now. Beetle exclaims, Hey, jumping bullfrogs, what's that, some kind of kite? Last picture, Ballas says, Jut tells me you can ride anything, Beetle. Well, get ready to mount a real bucker. Hey! <laughs> Does that mean that Beetle's supposed to get in that kite and ride it? I think that's what this idea is. Beetle's a small man, and he can fit into that big kite. Well, what for? Well, I believe that Ballast is going to try to guide that kite so it'll carry Beetle to the top of the rock. What for? Oh, you'll have to wait till next week to find that out. Now, let's turn over the page and see if... Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, and remember last week that Dale had been caught by the Martians. Yes, and they'd pulled uh, pulled her into their rocket ship thousands of miles in the air, and that's the same ship that Flash and Ginger are prisoners on, too. And the Martians thought Dale was dead, and were about to throw her out of the ship. Well, read quick. Uh, I want to see if Flash does something to stop her. All right, here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga, riga, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> that Dale has been killed by their cosmic ray blast. The Martian pirates start to cast her out into space. Flash shouts in desperation, Don't! Captain Toxo will want to see proof that you captured the Earth girl. The Martians are impressed by Flash's logic. They hesitate. In last picture top row, while the Martians are trying to decide what to do, Dale's eyes flutter open. Flash pretends to talk to Ginger, using American slang, which Dale will understand, but was meaningless to their captors. He says, Play possum, darling. Get him along. Dale quickly understands what he means and pretends to be dead again. Suddenly, first picture bottom row, an urgent message from Toxo forces the Martians to leave their prisoners temporarily unguarded. Dale works frantically to release Flash's bonds, and the moment he's free, she leaps to the control panel of the Martian spacecraft. While Dale controls the spaceship, Flash launches a surprise attack on the Martians who are in a forward compartment, but the uncanny creatures from another world are telepathically warned of the approaching danger. And last picture... A hissing sound fills the apartment. Dale gasps, warns Flash not to breathe. Flash guesses what new weapon the Martians are using, and he pants. Breathe oxygen. Put on your space helmets. They're letting all the air out of this ship. What are the Martians really doing? Well, they're trying to change the air in the room where Flash and Dale and Ginger are so that they won't be able to breathe oxygen which is what people from the Earth must breathe if they're to live. You mean they put something in there that doesn't have oxygen in it? That's right. Oh, that'd be terrible, because if they can't breathe... Yes, if they get their helmets on in time, though, maybe Flash will find a way to outsmart them. Do you think they will? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. But now, it's time for Dick's adventures, so let's get over to the very last page. And here he is, and I'm anxious to see whether Dick will have a new adventure today. Well, let's find that out right now. So here we go with Dick's adventures, and say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick. Dick has been reading a book just before falling asleep. As his eyes close, sleep comes, and the book he's been reading falls from his hand. Entering the room a few minutes later, Dick's dad smiles. The last great battle that made us a united country is in these pages, son. Eh. Hmm. Well, maybe.
maybe you're dreaming about it now. And in his dream, things begin to take shape in his mind as Dick goes back, back, back through the years. It's the early days of America. And in his dream, last picture, top row, Dick is leading a hard-riding company of Continental Cavalry, thundering down a dusty road of Virginia. It's just before dawn, September 1781. Reaching a farmhouse, Dick suddenly throws up his hand, and instantly the men jolt to a halt. Dick leaps off his horse and walks into the farmhouse. First picture next row, Dick reports to his commander-in-chief. We delivered all the dispatches, sir, to General Nathaniel Green, General Rochambeau, General Lafayette, General Kosciusko, and to Colonel Alexander Hamilton and Colonel Light Horse Harry Lee. General Green and Kosciusko are besieging Charleston. The others are closing in on Yorkton. By your order, sir. Washington nods his approval. And by an hour after dawn, last picture, second row, the fields around the farmhouse are swarming with troops. The stars and stripes are flying, but also the flag of France. For Ben Franklin and Lafayette have finally won French help. The whole vast American contingent moves. And then from the brow of a hill, first picture bottom row, Dick sees Yorktown, far at the end of the peninsula, where the red coats under Cornwallis have been driven with their backs to the sea. While coming up from behind them is a large French fleet under Admiral de Grasse. And Dick is saying, Cornwallis is a dead duck. He can't get out of this coop. While in a palace in England, last picture... A worried king is muttering, Yes, I agree that this rebel Washington is an admirable soldier, but Cornwallis will whip him to his knees. Be glad he must. Oh, it looks like they're preparing for a special big battle, aren't they? Oh, they are. They're preparing for a battle between George Washington and the English commander, General Cornwallis. That was one of the most famous battles ever fought in America. And we'll see that battle next week. Oh, I won't miss that. Mm. And now look, here's Rusty Riley underneath Dick's adventures. Do you remember last week that uh, Rusty and Tex found out that that horse that that little girl Queenie owned was a fine racehorse? Yes, that's the horse that Queenie was afraid would be sold. And that's why she had hidden the horse. Yes, and Rusty wants to help her out. And now maybe they can run the horse in a race and make money so Queenie won't be poor anymore. Well, let's read and find out if that's what happens. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Tex nods his head as he looks at Snowflake. Queenie's horse, and says, Yes, sir, Rusty, this here horse is a harness racer. Well, cool her off. Then come on in and see me in the barn. Okay, Tex. Come on, Queenie. As Queenie and Rusty walk the horse toward the barn, Queenie asks Rusty if Snowflake isn't a racehorse. Rusty replies, Oh, sure she is, Queenie. Only instead of being ridden by a jockey, she pulls a little two-wheel cart called a sulky. <laughs> A little later, Rusty and Tex are talking. Third picture, top row. Tex is saying, Now, Rusty, before we go too far with this horse of Queenie's, I figure we ought to find out a little more about Queenie's father. Snowflake looks like valuable property. Yeah, I I know what you mean, Tex, but what I promised Queenie, I wouldn't tell her dad. At least not for the presents. Tex walks over and takes down his jacket, last picture, top row, saying, Well, okay, lad, but... You and I better take a little ride over to the Lexington Trotters track. Old Sam may be able to tell us something. Rusty answers. Oh, that's the track where the plug horse derbies run. First picture bottom row. Arriving at the Trotters track, Tex says to Rusty as he gets out of the car... Yep, old Sam was one of the greatest drivers in his day. What he don't know about harness racing, you could write on a postage stamp with a shaving brush. Oh, there he is, fixing that sulky. Why, Sam? I'd like a little information. Old Sam replies. Say, you want some information, Tex? Well, what is it? I'll help you if I can. Sam, 
Of all the outstanding trotters or pacers of the last five years, how many were white? They settled down on a bench, old Sam says. Yeah, not many, Tex. Right off the bat, I can only recall about six patties outstanding horses. Tex says, hmm, good. Now I'll narrow it down still more. The horse I have in mind is a white mare with a black stocking on her near hind leg. Old Sam sits up straight and says pertly, Black stocking. Heck, Tex, that's easy. Couldn't be no other horse than Rhina Blanca. Mm, she was a dilly. Uh, but her owner was ruled off the tracks. Never believed he'd done what they accused him of. But him and his horses dropped plumb out of sight. Tex's eyes narrow thoughtfully as he says. Hey, let's hear more, Sam. What was he supposed to have done? <laughs> Snowflake is the horse that old Sam's talking about. It might be. And old Sam says he was a wonderful racehorse. Oh, I'm anxious to find out about this. Wouldn't they let that man race the horse anymore? Well, that's what he's saying, and that man could be Queenie's father. Oh, I can hardly wait to find out more about this. Well, you'll have to, but I promise you next week we'll find out whether or not the horse old Sam's talking about is Snowflake. And we'll also find out whether the man he's talking about is Queenie's father. Oh, isn't this exciting? I certainly won't miss that. Neither will I. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Mr. Tony Bigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Man.